Good morning, gang. Happy Wednesday morning. Okay. Uh, we all know what's going on with these mass influxes of illegal aliens coming into the country. I can call them migrants or immigrants or whatever. They're illegal aliens. I'm sorry. There's no other way to describe them. I don't care what Alejandro Mayorkas says. They're illegal aliens, and they are not here to do us well, period. We saw the deal yesterday with Sean P. Diddy Combs getting arrested for all the child trafficking and human trafficking and his wild parties, we'll just put it that way, try to keep it somewhat clean this morning. We know the whole story about Harvey Weinstein. We know the whole story about, well, no, we don't know the whole story about Jeffrey Epstein. We're hoping to find that one out. Uh, but what's going on, all right? And how safe are you? Now, everybody knows the stories that are going on in Springfield, Ohio. You probably heard the stories going on down in Alabama or in Pennsylvania. I know I've mentioned them about all these illegal aliens being dumped into these small towns, ironically, all in red states, and just raising nine kinds of hell there. I got an email yesterday from Kathy, one of y'all, and she sent this story from somebody that she knows, and I want to read this to you. Now, I'll give you the idea of where this is. This is in the southwestern corner, somewhat outside of Grand Rapids, Michigan, right? And of course, yesterday, Trump had his rally in Flint that a lot of us watched, <clears throat> Flint being basically on the other side of the state. But this is what's going on. And I want you to listen to this and think about it as we go. All right. It's a little long, but I'm going to read it here. Three times in the last week, we've had newcomers driving down our long driveway to our door, trying to sell us stuff. It's all of a sudden, and it's too many. The first two times, it was only two people in each car. I figured they were getting creative with ways to make money. No big deal. Everybody has a right to work to survive. Okay. But two days ago, when we were working on trying to save our, the little preemie calf and waiting for the vet to arrive, we had a brand new SUV full of immigrants, seven or eight adult males in their prime, packed into this SUV, pull up by the house and park. <clears throat> One male came to our door. His accent was heavy, South African maybe, but he spoke English. My husband answered the door, I won't mention his name, and stepped onto the porch with the baby bottle in his hand. I went out about 30 seconds later with a lubed up farm animal thermometer in one hand and my phone in the other. Then the man noticed I had come out to the door and said, oh, there's two of you. He looked a little nervous but started his salesman speech again and seemed to relax a little. He said, well, maybe you both can come. He then asked Steve, don't you want to see what we have in the car for you? Steve said, no, I'm busy right now. Steve and I looked at each other. I whispered to Steve, that's a carload of adult men. There were literally seven or eight men in that car, so many piled in there that I couldn't get a good head count. The man on the porch yelled to the driver of the car, can I bring them both? The driver said in English, I guess it's okay. Steve said, no, I don't think so. I chimed in and said, we have a sick baby cow and we have to keep working to try to save his life. Then the strange man broke out in grins. I said, we're farmers and right now a baby's life is in our hands. We do not have time to visit. The man that had come to our porch kept eyeballing the thermometer I was carrying like it was making him nervous. He said, what is that? Steve's a very quick thinker. He looked at the thermometer and asked, do you have that thing ready? So I said, yeah, do you want to see? And I moved it toward him. He hollered, don't get that thing near me. And I just laughed and said, don't worry, I won't poke you with it. My husband then said, you better not. I don't need that shit. The man standing next to us seemed to get really nervous again. He had followed us halfway to the barn where we had stopped in the driveway. He didn't want to take a carload of immigrants down to the barn with us. 
there was just a knowing between me and my husband that the less these people saw of the uh, property, the better. And we both knew the other was nervous because of how in, uh, insistent the one man had been about trying to get us to go to the car while refusing to tell us anything about what they were trying to sell. He just kept saying, it's a surprise, come see. So here we are standing in the driveway with the man, with one man that kept moving very close to us every time either of us took a step away. I thought maybe the conversation would end there because I explained again that we had to go help with the baby cow so he wouldn't die. I kept saying we don't have time to visit, but the driver had also followed us in the car. So here we are, uh, or I'm sorry, the driver asked if we had predators that were trying to take out our animals. I don't know if he had a genuine interest in learning about farm animals, but I had a distinct feeling from the get-go that these people were up to no good. They'd been trying to lure my husband to the car, and he refused to tell him why since they arrived. So when the driver asked about the problems with predators, I was really glad when my husband said, we have an occasional coyote, we just shoot them. The man standing next to us looked at me and said, do you shoot them too? And I replied, I like to shoot the opossums. My husband then said, she'll shoot the people that bother us too. I had a laugh at that one. And then I said, hey, I've only ever shot one person around here. Then the driver said, we'll let you get back to your business as the man standing next to us was running back to the car. As soon as he was in, they left in a hurry. I want you to think about this story real quick and everything that they did right and how much could have gone wrong. You have a bunch of immigrants who came up to the house trying to sell cleaning supplies, apparently. I edited down the story a little bit, otherwise I'd been reading it for 10 minutes, uh, and trying to entice them to come over and look at the cleaning supplies that they had in the trunk of the car. That was a surprise. It's cleaning supplies. I mean, what are you going to send me? Sell me some pine saw? That's a big surprise? No. Okay. You'd have to be foolish to go out there with them. And I think most people agree there. But this is the tactics they're taking. What was the actual intent of something like this? Could it have been, gee, mom was only the only one home, and there's seven or eight of us. This is real easy for an abduction. Seven or eight guys could probably overwhelm uh, a woman. Seven or eight guys could have overwhelmed both of them, no problem. Okay. Could it have been casing the place out to see if it was worth anything worth stealing? that they could go in. How many chickens do you have? There's a whole litany of things that could have been done by these people. And this is not in Springfield, Ohio, or in Pennsylvania, or in Alabama, or in Aurora, Colorado, all the places that we've heard that these illegal aliens are going around and infiltrating the communities like crazy. This is somebody who's out on their 200-acre farm where it's very quiet. Door-to-door -door salesmen are not going from farm to farm like that, driving like crazy to go to one place. Just not happening. These people were smart. They mentioned shooting animals. The joke about shooting a person was probably enough to freak the guy out a little bit. But if anything, they told him, we will defend ourselves. This is where we've gotten to at this point. This is why you hear me say all the time, do not go anywhere unarmed. Because you have no idea when the bad guys, which inevitably, I'm sorry, seven or eight guys do not get together in a car as a traveling salesman. Why aren't they in seven or eight different cars going to seven or eight different houses at the same time? Okay. This could have turned out really, really, really bad. But fortunately, there were two of them, and they were armed. What would you have done in that situation? Hopefully you didn't say, yeah, sure, let me go out and see what you've got in the trunk. Because the next thing is, 
You would have been the one in the trunk. Nothing from the story, nothing turned out badly for anybody. The illegals probably said, we ain't going to this house. But it brings up a big question of how safe are you? How safe is your family? I mean, let's use the a very hypothetical. Dad goes to work every day. Mom stays home and bakes pies. Yeah, I know. I'm going back to leave it to Beaver here. If this happened and just one person was home, does mom know how to defend herself? What if mom's home with the kids or a baby? First off, look out the door, see who it is, and, you know, recognize them, don't answer them, okay? And then the second thing is, until that car drives away, you are standing 10 feet away from the door with a shotgun, with a rifle, with a pistol, because the moment they break that window, you make them Swiss cheese. That's just the reality of what we are. And I mean, honestly, I don't care if they're African migrants, if they're Hispanic migrants, if they're Asian migrants, if they're European migrants. Race, creed, color means nothing in this situation. It's pretty bad when you go, you can't trust anybody. But that's the world we live in right now. If I don't know you, I'm on guard. I'm ready. You're walking through the store. You have no idea what's running through everybody else's mind. Somebody could be picking through the peaches there in the produce department and say, you know what? I don't like any of these peaches and pull out a pistol and start shooting people. They'll come to your house. This is how brazen they are at this point. That they're going to come up. They're going to look to see who's home. Oh, gee, it's an old lady. Oh, gee, it's a young lady. Oh, gee, it's two kids that are latchkey kids home after school. Think about this. When I was a kid, by the time I was about mm, eight, I think it was, seven or eight maybe, I was allowed to, to come home from school, no adult present, my folks were working, and okay, between roughly three o'clock when I got home and roughly six o'clock when my folks got home, I did my homework or I was out in the backyard playing there with no adults, okay. Now, I wouldn't leave my teenager's home alone without some sort of supervision, unless, of course, those teenagers were very well-versed in self-protection, had heard stories like this, had those hard conversations on the couch asking your 14-year-old, what would you do? And the answer better not be, call 911. Pinball out.